Read the Bible, that's God speaking to us. When we pray to Jesus, he, he speaks to us and He answers our prayers. And why do you think it's important to talk to God? Judah, do you talk to Jesus? Yeah. Yeah, what does he say? Amen. Amen. <laughs> well, today we're going to learn about how important it is to talk to God and to know God so we can know the things of God. Because how are we going to know what God wants if we don't talk to Him? How would you know? Well, how would you know what your mom wants if you don't talk to her? We got a lively group today, don't we? <laughs> All right. Okay. Well, you guys, you guys, get up. You want to help us sing Happy Birthday? So today is the first of the month, and what we're going to do is we like to celebrate birthdays, anniversaries, spiritual birthdays, and what we do is we we have the Oklahoma Baptist. Um, homes for children, the, the, the ministry that Oklahoma Baptist, we, we sponsor, and, and it, that what that does is it helps orphans and, and all kids of all shapes, sizes, and backgrounds, and it's really just speaking God into their lives. So if you have an anniversary or a birthday or a spiritual anniversary that today, we'd love to celebrate with you. You guys go ahead. Be filled with dancing. 
streets be filled with joy. May justice bow to Jesus as the people turn and pray from the mountain to the
Father, we just give you thanks today. Thank you for each one that's here. Uh, just pray now that you bless this offering for your kingdom. I uh, believe Brother Adam as he brings your message to us in a few moments. And Father, just thank you for loving us. And just give you all the praise for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <laughs>
Somebody sings, they leave the room, so I don't get to. Oh, <laughs> That's 
an important reminder, isn't it? It doesn't matter who people say what people say about us. It doesn't matter what people think about us. What matters is what God says about us, what God thinks about us, and what God did for us. Amen. And so if you would turn with me in your Bibles to John chapter seven. Yes, ma'am. Sure. Okay. I just wanted to pray for more today and, and let everybody know that I'm so much better. I had pneumonia for a week, but I'm better today and I'm giving all the glory to the Lord today for that. Amen. And Amen. I'm just overwhelmed. And I want to just testify. Amen. 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 You know what? Sandy, thank you. Now, now we got this started. Let's just say this. I want to give a testimony. Can I, Martha, can I tell you a testimony? Ooh. All right. Well, Miss Martha got a call today. Said no more dialysis this week. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't that exciting to see what God's doing in the church? I think one of y'all want me to meet Jesus soon. If I'm just going to come here. You know how antsy I get, so I'm just going to move this one. Oh, I see what happened. You got them mixed up. It might have been Rachel trying to trip me up, wasn't it? <laughs> now we're safe. You know idea that was? He, he failed. John chapter 7. We're going to be in verse 14. And while you guys are turning there, just a couple quick announcements. Tonight we've got the Bible trivia night. And that's, that's an exciting, I think we're going to learn something. It's going to be a time for fellowship and to get to know each other a little better. Um, I was printing off, typing up the questions this week, and there's, there's some stuff in there that I didn't really know. So um, there, apparently there's a, there's a man in the Bible. I'm, I, I'm going to give you one question because I was so excited when I saw this one. <clears throat> so forget I said it as soon as you heard it, which, you know. Most of you do that anyways, right? I'm just kidding. There's a man in the Bible with six fingers and six toes on each foot and each hand. Oh, I didn't know that. So, you mad? He looked like a cartoon coming through there with all those fingers and toes. But yeah, trivia night tonight at 5 o'clock. We'll be over there in the fellowship hall. We're going to have some snacks and cookies and stuff and, and tea and stuff to drink. And it'll just be an hour. It'll be a lot of fun. I would encourage you to be there for that. And then, um, I think that's it. Let's, let's get into it. John chapter 7. How, how great is it to understand the things of God? To understand, to know the things of God. Uh, the, the, the learned men call this doctrine. And doctrine, you might, be, you might describe that or define that as the scriptural teaching of theological truths. So put simply... In, in my words, because my words are often simple, doctrine is the gospel of God, Amen. from God, for us. Amen. But it does not come from man. You know, man's gospel is a, a gospel that will damn you to hell. It is the gospel of God that saves. What are some essentials of this gospel of God? Well, Jesus is God. Amen. Jesus died for our sins. These are two of the tent poles that we stake our faith and our belief on, aren't they? This is the doctrine of God. But often this doesn't make sense to the world, does it? What does Paul say to the Corinthians? For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing. But to those of us who are being saved, it is the power of God. That makes sense to us. Because we know the things of God. We have Put our faith in the things of God because we believe what God says when he speaks to us. But as we will see today, the power of God is madness to those living outside of his will. Because yeah. often we, we encounter people like this in the world, don't we? We, we, we bring the Bible to them or, and we, we evangelize and we, we preach and they say, you know what? This Jesus stuff, it's just not for me. You know, I, I tried church. I went there, and, and people were nasty, and people hurt me, so I'm not going back. To which we often say, well, that was people that hurt you. That's not God. And you, you know what? You go find a perfect church, and you let me know where it's at, Bubba, because I would love to be there. But people living outside of God's will, they don't understand these things, because often they don't want to know these things, do they? 
It is the power of God to those who are being saved, but to those outside of that, it's madness. And I pray to those of you, if you are in this room today, the things of God are madness to you. I pray that you would come to know Him today and they would start to make sense to you. Every time you open it up, it makes sense a little more and a little more and a little more. But trust me, you can do this for 30, 40, 50 years and it's not all going to make sense right away, is it? It is a journey. It is a... A, a, a yearning, a pursuit of the things that He has for us. To understand the things of God just a little more day after day after day. And today's scripture, when we'll be in John chapter 7, it finds us in the middle of the Feast of Booths, or the Feast of Tabernacles, if you will. And remember, this is a, a, a joyous uh, seven-day celebration of God's celebrate, uh, not celebration, provision in the wilderness. The people were in, in the wilderness for 40 years, and they used this Feast of Booths to celebrate how he kept providing for them and providing for them. And he, we, we learned a couple weeks ago that they make these, these makeshift tents with uh, sticks and leaves and stuff. And they live outside their homes in these tents to kind of remind them of, of what God did for them in the wilderness and to celebrate the way he provided for them when they didn't think or when maybe it didn't look like it was going to come through the way they liked. I believe Martha Love's been celebrating the Feast of Tabernacles this week. She's celebrating God's provision where it looked like there might not have been a chance. Amen. This is a joyous time. This is a joyous time of celebration when Jews from all over would descend upon Jerusalem for the parades and worship and finishing with this climactic ceremony on the last day, which we will get into next week. But we start in verse 14 here, and let me read through 20, and we'll get right into what God is doing here. About the middle of the feast, Jesus went, into the, went up into the temple and began teaching. The Jews therefore marveled, saying, How is it that this man has learning when he has never studied? So Jesus answered them, My teaching is not mine, but his who sent me. Amen. If anyone's will is to do God's will, he will know whether the teaching is from God or whether I am speaking on my own authority. The one who speaks on his own authority seeks his own glory. But the one who seeks the glory of him who sent him is true, and in him there is no falsehood. Has not Moses given you the law? Yet none of you keeps the law. Why do you seek to kill me? The crowd answered, you have a demon. Who is, who is seeking to kill you? And you see right away here that their lack of understanding, it's not coming from a, an, an, an inability to understand. It's coming from a desire to not understand. Because at a certain point, you can put something in front of somebody so many times, it becomes that they don't want to get it rather than they don't know how to get it or they just can't get it. So in other words, they aren't getting it now because they don't want to understand. They just, they don't want to. So I would ask you a question here, and I think this is a good question to ask of these verses, is who do you glorify? Who do you glorify in your life? Now, I would venture to say, if I went to each of you personally right now, and I said, who do you glorify in your life? You would say, well, God. I glorify God. Of course I glorify God. That's why I'm here, right? You think that's what the Pharisees might have said if somebody asked them the same question? Oh, Nicodemus or Gamaliel, Gamaliel. Who do you glorify? To God be the glory. I glorify God. That is my purpose. That is why he has placed me on this earth, to glorify God. We have devoted ourselves to his law. And wouldn't it be great if this were true? They said, oh, I glorify God. Wouldn't it be great if everybody had said that it, it, was, it was true? So examine your life. Examine your actions, your thoughts, your heart. And then say, who do you, when you read the scriptures, who do you glorify? When you read the scriptures, do you make it all about yourself? Who do you glorify when you read God's word? Who do you glorify in your speech when you talk to people? 
What does your language look like? Who do you glorify when you talk? Who do you glorify when you drive? Now, we're not all perfect. We're going to fail. Sometimes our two-year-old will repeat things we say in the car. <laughs> we are being sanctified. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Who do you glorify in your speech? Who do you glorify in your relationships? Not only in your marital relationships, but in the relationships with your, with your church family, in your relationships with your work family, with your friends, with your pastor. Who do you glorify in those relationships? Who do you glorify in your work? Whether it be at your actual job or your, your duties as a Sunday school teacher or as a parent or as a secretary. No matter what it may be, we all have an opportunity each day to glorify God. Whether you are retired or whether you've been going at it for 20 years, there is an opportunity each day to glorify God. And you have a decision to make. This is not an involuntary, you wake up and God says, all right, you're going to glorify me and I'm going to make it happen. No, it is a decision each day to glorify him. And you have the power to make that decision for yourself. To the things you give authority in your life, so goes the glory. Like the, the old saying, you want to know where your heart is, follow the money. What do you spend your money on? That's where your heart is. If God's word is not the authority in your life, you will never understand the things of God. God's word must, must, must be the authority in your life. Well, you will never understand what he's trying to do in your life, for your life, to bless you and your family and your family's family. Or your church. You know how puzzling it is to me when I get somebody that either comes to the office or calls me and they're struggling with something and it, it's just, oh my gosh, pastor, it's this and that and I'm having trouble finding work and everybody's mean to me and all this stuff. So I started asking, okay, what did you do for your Bible study this morning? What was the last thing you read in the Bible? What was the rest? What was the last Bible study? What did you do this morning? What did you read? Uh, well, uh, well, I, I just, I, you know what, I've been so busy, and it just, I, could, I haven't been able to get to it like I should, and I know, Pastor, I know I should be doing it, but I just, you know what, I just, I'm just struggling, I feel like God's not really speaking to me. He's doing it right there. He's doing it right there. He's doing it right there. And we could go on for the next 1,030 pages. You know how, how frustrating it is. You, you say, well, God's not really speaking to me and I'm just struggling really in my life. And I say, well, what's the, what's the Bible study you did this morning? What, what was the last thing you read? I don't know. Well, there you go, Steve. There you go. Now, not Steve, not the one. The mom, so. <laughs> He's not the one. I'm sure he reads his Bible faithfully. Christ is the very mouthpiece of God and he is God in the flesh and he has spoken to us through God's word. He walks under God's authority. He teaches under God's authority. He acts as God's authority. He is God's authority. Go on. He is God's authority. He is Emmanuel. He is the head of the church. He is the authority in this church. Not Adam. Not the deacons. Not, the, not Renee, nobody's the, the authority in this church except for God himself. Amen. Will you submit to his authority? Amen. And we see a picture of this authority of the family unit. Paul says to the Ephesians in chapter 5, he says, For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. As the home is meant to act under the leadership of the husband, so do we as the church act under the authority of our Messiah and his word. Amen. Amen. And with Christ's authority in mind, 
I want you to see in verse 20 of John chapter 7 why the comments of the crowd are, are so dangerous. Why they are so volatile in their response to our Messiah. They said, you have a demon. You have a demon. Who? Who is seeking to kill you? And I'm sure after the initial, what are you talking about? You know, you ever had those moments where somebody says something off the wall and you say, what are you talking about? There is a deeper issue at play here, though. After the, what are you talking about in the confusion? There's, there's something a lot deeper going on here. To attack the integrity of the messenger is a direct assault on the messenger, or on the sender himself. Mm -hmm. To attack the sender, or to attack the messenger, is to attack the sender. Let me be very clear about this. You attack God's people, and it's the same as launching an assault on God himself. Well, let me put it another way, since we just read Ephesians chapter 5, to, to attack the integrity of the household and those within it is the same as attacking the head of the house himself. Pastor Matt Carter says here of Jesus and his words, he connects the head to the heart. He says submission comes before understanding. The gateway to the mind is the heart. If you want to understand the things of God, you must submit to the things of God. Amen. If you do not submit, you will never understand. And let's be, let's be very clear here. This is important. Unbelief. Choosing not to believe the things of God causes misunderstanding. People don't understand because they don't believe. <coughs> misunderstanding, as we see here, has elevated to strife, to conflict, Within God's people here. Unbelief. Misunderstanding. Conflict. Now you know why obedience is a necessary aspect of learning? And this is what Jesus is trying to communicate to the Pharisees here. Obedience must come before understanding. If you do not submit, you will never know. You must submit to the things of God. You're not getting it because you don't want to get it at this point. You don't understand because you don't want to understand it has gone beyond misunderstanding at this point. It is something entirely different. It has elevated to rebellion at this point. It's not misunderstanding. And it, it has been a fact since you look at the book of Acts, read through Acts, since from the moments the church started, there has been conflict in the church. Chapter 5. Read Acts chapter 5. Ananias and Sapphira. They like to talk, and it's not all true what happens to them. There has been conflict in the church since the church began. But this conflict and this strife within the church, it doesn't come from a lack of head knowledge or your insecurities. No, it comes from rebellion. It comes from rebellion, not to man's rules. You create conflict in the church. You're not rebelling against Adam's rules. You're rebelling against God's law. Amen. You better check yourself before you wreck yourself. <laughs> That's right, Hannah. Thug comes out sometimes. <laughs> he says in verse 19, has, has Moses not given you the law? They, yet none of you keep the law. See, now look what he's doing. He's coming after their obedience to the law. This is their bread and butter. This is their honey in the pot. This is their pride and joy, their obedience to the law. This is what they stake their reputations on and their successes on and their power on is their obedience to the law. And now Jesus says, you know what? Let me talk to you for a minute. At the same time that he said this, that Moses gave the law, yet none of you keep the law. He's revealing this dangerous arrogance of the Pharisees' actions and thoughts. You see, their, their unbelief came to misunderstanding, went to conflict, and now it, it, it has blossomed into arrogance. 
this arrogance a lot of times is defined by a self-righteous hypocrisy. We see it throughout the lives of the Pharisees. It's a self-righteous hypocrisy that, that they, they, they stake their claim on. That's how they hold on to their power. It's not you guys are terrible, but we keep the law because we work in the church. We're good. We're good. It's an attitude that even generation, generations later, after the Bible was written and completed, even today would still exist in the church and would undo the church if left unchecked. That's why you, you see how many pastors are falling now because of their, their self-righteous hypocrisy. They, they preach one way, but they live another way. Or how many members in the church undo all the things that God has done on Sundays because they say one thing in the church and they live another way outside See how dangerous this is, this self-righteous hypocrisy of the Pharisees? And what it would do if, if Jesus said, you know what? You guys do you, okay? You're not hurting anybody but yourself. You go ahead and you do what you're going to do. That's madness to say that. It must be addressed. Attitudes, it would, it would undo the church. Y'all, anybody watch Batman in here? Josh, my man, I knew you'd raise your hand. There's a, there's a guy, a villain in there called Two-Face. Now, I'm not going to get into the origin stories. I'm not going to get into the, the history and why he is the way he is. I know, Dale, I know you don't have time for that. I'll, I'll come by the house later and I'll, I'll explain it to you. <laughs> but bear with me. Two-Face, you know what he's got? Two he's got two faces. Now, this is a, one side is scarred and, and disfigured from a, a chemical spill, and the other is a normal, good-looking, handsome man. He was actually, his name is Harvey Dick, you know what? <laughs> He's got two faces. One is scarred and disfigured and, and, and just, just marred. And the other side is a handsome, well-to-do, wealthy-looking face. We all struggle with sin. Amen. We all struggle with sin. Uh -huh. We all have this flesh that battles against the things of God. Yeah. From the moment we wake up in the mornings, we are assaulted by the world and the things of this world as an attack on our flesh. Uh -huh. Here's what the self-righteous person does. You, Two-face. Mm. With this broken side, this good side. Self-righteous persons such as the Pharisees, they turn their face, but you can't see the mess. But not only do they turn their face, but they treat people as if this other side does not exist. They treat people as if they are not horribly scarred and under attack by sin themselves. They treat people as if this is it. They turn their face to the pretty side and they act as if all the nasty parts don't exist. They ignore their own. I had a conversation recently and, and what came of it was this. You, you know, there, there are different things that we're looking at and, and the gist of it was this. We got down to why people do the things they do. And in this particular case, they, they always they like, to put, they like to put everyone down to feel better about who they are. They like to keep this face turned. Until you confront this sin nature. You just dig in your hole. See how dangerous this is? See how dangerous it is to act like we don't struggle, to act like we don't have hardships, to act like we're, we're, we're so much better than all these, these dirty low lives that are struggling with sin. You see how dangerous that is? And at the end of verse 19 here, Jesus calls him on it. He just comes right after it. He says, after he says, has not Moses given you the law, yet none of you keeps the law? Why? Why do you seek to kill me? Why are you coming after me? Now this is the first time in John's gospel here that he has vocalized their murderous intent. This is the first time that he said it out loud. Now we've been, it has been said before in the words, but never by Jesus from his mouth. And now he's, he's calling them on it, you know. It, it, the issue needs to be addressed. He says, why do you guys, y'all don't even follow the law. Why do you want to kill me? 
And you see how they respond? In verse 20, you have a demon! Who wants to kill you? And here's, can I tell you how I read it? It's this indignation. You say, why do you guys want to kill me? And they're, you can imagine they're standing up. Nate, who wants to kill you? No, no. Who, who, you, you're talking crazy talk. Who wants to kill you? See, when you confront someone with their sin, as Jesus is doing here, usually it goes one of two ways. They either lean into it and they try to justify themselves and what they said and what they did. Well, you know, it just, I don't, yeah, this, that, yeah, blip, 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 blip. They try to justify their sin by leaning into it. Or they go the other way and they play the victim, don't they? Oh, no. Oh, Lord, no, not me. Who's trying to kill you, Lord? Who said those nasty things? Oh, no. I, I would never. I was just trying to help. And somehow... In verse 20 here, somehow the Pharisees respond both ways. They manage to play the victim, and they manage to lean into it and justify themselves at the same time. You have a demon. You have a demon. That's why we do the things we do. Who wants to keep you? Oh, no, 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 not me. Not me. So Jesus, as Jesus <coughs> tends to do... He says, you know what, I'm, I'm, I'm done. Let me spell it out for you, okay? Let me tell you. Just let me, let me make it make sense for you because obviously I can see you don't want it to make sense for yourself. You're, you're hiding from it. You're pushing it away. So Jesus starts in verse 21 here and he says, you know what, let me spell it out for you, brothers and sisters, because you're not getting it. In verse 21 here, Jesus answered them, I did one work. And you all marvel at it. Moses gave you circumcision. Not that it was from Moses, but from the fathers. And you circumcise a man on the Sabbath. If on the Sabbath a man receives circumcision, so the law of Moses may not be broken, are you angry with me because on the Sabbath I made a man's whole body well? Do not judge by appearances, but judge with right judgment. I did one work. That's what he says. I did one work. In John's fifth chapter, we, we see this one work that, that Jesus is referring to. He, he goes to the pool called Bethesda, and there was a crowd of invalids and, and, and paralyzed and sick men and women. They had been laying there for any amounts of time. And Jesus comes, and he finds this man who, who had been waiting 38 years for the water to start in the hopes of being healed. They had this belief that the angel would stir the waters and if they could get down there first, that they would be healed. And Jesus finds this man who has been broken, who has been invalid, who has lost hope 38 years ago. And what does he say? Do you want to be healed? Stand up, pick up your mat, walk on out here. He changes this man's life with a word. Amen. He does this one work. Amen. And this one work changed his entire life. And instead of rejoicing, instead of celebrating that a broken man has been made whole, you know what, remember what the Jewish leaders did? They marveled. But not marvel in the sense that we see marvel like, oh, that's so great. That is awesome. I, 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 I marvel at this, this accomplishment, at this celebration. No, they marveled that Jesus would dare, he would dare to do this on the holy day. They, they don't have a problem with what he did. They have a problem with when he did it. And therefore, all should be undone. How dare you, Jesus, heal this man on the holy day, holy day and break our mosaic law. Oh, Jesus, you should be ashamed of yourself. Look, we are holy men. Got that button today. That's not it. As he, as he healed this man, he continues to talk to them and he makes himself equal with God. 
He, he claims equality with God. I was sent from God. I am from God. He, I am the Son of God. So much so that they wanted to kill him. They don't have time to celebrate because they are overcome with this, this anger in their hearts and this obedience and this arrogance and this sort of self-righteous hypocrisy. They are so overcome with it in their hearts that they ignore everything else that God is doing around them. And now they want to kill a man for healing a man. He says, I did one word. But you, you circumcise a man on the Sabbath. In Leviticus chapter 12, it, it, it elucidates a little. It says, on the eighth day of the flesh, his foreskin shall be circumcised. This is the Mosaic law. This is the law that we're going to put out for the people of Israel um, to, to testify to the holiness of God. He was making a people holy unto himself. That's what the book of Leviticus is. And it says plainly right there in Leviticus chapter 3, chapter 12, verse 3. On the eighth day, his flesh shall be circumcised. Now, why was circumcision so important in the Old Testament? Because it's important to know in the New Testament, they say, you know what? It doesn't matter one way or another. We are all made the same under Jesus Christ. But why was it so important in the New Testament? Well, first of all, because God commanded it. Amen. That's first. Amen. And second of all, it's this symbolism of cutting away. We know that, that God would cut off covenant breakers from his presence among his people. And his people, as they were kept out and as they were among the other chosen of God's people, that they would break the covenant, that they would sin against God, they would be cut off from his presence. That's one of the symbolic natures of this circumcision. The other one was the cutting away of the filth of the fallen and sinful nature. Cutting it away. Even if a baby was eight days old on the Sabbath, they still carried out the ritual. And that's that's what he's getting at here. Every time an eight, an eight day old baby comes to you on the Sabbath, you still do what you're supposed to do. It's, it's what you might call the lesser to the greater <coughs> argument. He's taking the lesser issue and pointing them to the greater need. As the, the English Standard Version, as the Study Bible says in their comments, they, they put it like this. If perfecting one part of the body on the Sabbath was legitimate, how much more so is the healing of an entire person? How much more so? See, in this context, though, we read perfecting as coming closer to God through obedience to his commandment. So if you're obedient in the little things, how much more so is it to be obedient in the big things? How much more so is it important for me to heal this man who has been broken for 38 years while you do the, the, the circumcision and the operation at eight days old? In other words, Jesus speaks to them and he said, how... How do you justify enforcing this small thing? How do you justify enforcing this small thing to the people? But you condemn me for the greater good. How do you make sense of this? You would rather let a man remain broken, remain unhealed, remain separated from God so that you won't be offended. <coughs> And your poor religious sensibilities will be kept intact. You would rather this man, man remain an invalid while you continue to break the law every time you have an eight-day-old baby come to the temple. You know why I don't get offended when visitors wear hats in here? Because they're in the door! The, you know, and sometimes... It, and, don't you think God can hear their prayers through that little piece of cloth? <coughs> See, a broken man comes in here with a hat and he comes to the altar and he's praying and he's like, God, I need you to change me. I need you to save me. I need you to do this. I can't do it on my own. There's always going to be somebody in the crowd. Oh, I wish he'd take his hat off and have some respect. You may not vocalize it because I don't think anybody's that silly. <laughs> Be with me later. You can read the commentary. 
<laughs> Don't you think God can hear the prayers of a broken soul through a hat? That's why I don't get offended when somebody comes in here and they got a hat on. But it almost seems like the eleventh commandment sometimes, doesn't it? You shall not kill, that shall not steal, you shall obey your own dad, you shall you shall not have no other idols. Yeah, hold on. Thou shalt not wear hats in church, and thou shalt never wear shorts. <laughs> That's not the eleventh commandment. <laughs> Why would we be so worried about what someone is wearing when lives are at stake? Lives are at stake. We are in a war. We are in a war. We are in a war. People are dying out there. And we're worried about what we're wearing in here. Wake up, people. I don't care if you have a hat on. You can, you can come sit on the altar with me while I'm preaching what you had on. I don't care. Jesus said, Come to me, all who labor. And are heavy laden. Yes. All who labor. Even if you have a hat on. Even if you have tattoos all over your body. Amen. Even if your clothes are torn. Even if you stink. Even if you're lost. Even if you're struggling. Even if you're overcome with your failures and your disappointments. Even if you are overcome by the weight of the world and you forgot to take your head on the way, head off on the way to church. He says, come to me, all who are labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Amen. Come to me. That, that's the attitude that we should adopt in our own lives as Second Baptist Church. God says, come to me. We should swing the doors wide open and say, come on in. Get in here. I'll save you a seat. I know a lot of us, a lot of you are old school. Y'all got that old school Jesus. You know? <laughs> I mean, we've been here a hundred years. Some of you have been here for the majority of those. It's not that the attitude and the dress of our church have fallen off. That's not it. That's what it's going to look like when you're doing what the church is supposed to do. When you are carrying out the mission as God has commanded it, that's what church is going to look like. Amen. Amen. You're going to have tattoos. You're going to have nose rings. You're going to have tattoos. You know what? You, you guys were blessed by Brother Josh West up here preaching last week. Amen. Yeah, he's, he's, a, he's a man of God, right? He's a titan among men. I went swimming with him a lot of times. Anybody shake hands with him last week? You see his knuckles? It said Josh West across his knuckles. If he were to take his shirt off, you would see tattoos up and down his arms. You would see tattoos up and down his chest. If he were to take his, if he were to wear shorts, <laughs> if he were to wear shorts, you would see tattoos up and down his legs. Yeah, it's covered. And he's one of the most godly men that I have ever met. It does not matter what you look like. It does not matter what you wear. It does not matter what you did yesterday. It does not matter what you came in here with. It does not matter what you are struggling with. It does not matter if you are overcome with your emotion and your anxieties and your depressions. You know what? None of that matters because you bring it in here and lay it at the altar. He says, come to me. All who labor in our heavy labor. Not just if you've been good this week. Not just if you've followed all the rules this week. Not just if you dressed right. Not just if you did your Bible study exactly like the pastor told you to in his sermon last Sunday. Not just if you've done that. All who labor in our heavy laden. And I will give you rest. Amen. Verse 24, it says, Do not judge by appearances, but judge with right judgment. Mm -hmm. this, is as, this is just as much a direct challenge to the Pharisees' religious authority as it is to our own. 
do not judge by appearances, but judge with right judgment. And I'll, I'll close with this. To know the things of God, you must put away what you think you know. You must put away whatever authority you think you have in the church. Truth be told, we none of us have authority. You must put away what you think you know. You must put away whatever authority you think you have. You must put away your entitlement. You must put away your aggression. You must put away your hypocrisy. You must put it all away. You must, you must bury your self-righteousness. To know the things of God, your pride must die. Yes. Yes. Your pride must die. Crucify your flesh daily. Kill your pride every single day in order to know the things of God. As the Apostle Paul said, and I'll, I'll, I'll close with these verses. Paul said in Galatians chapter 5, For you were called to freedom, brothers. You were called to freedom. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. But through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. He has won the battle against our flesh. He has defeated the darkness in your heart. You might have been dead in your trespasses. You might have been dead when you walked in the door. You may have been lost. You may have been broken. You may have been dead to sin. But he can make you alive again in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, he can make you alive again. Amen. So maybe you've come in here today with anger in your heart. Maybe you've come in here today and you've carried the weight of the world on your shoulders. Today is the time to unload that weight, brothers and sisters. You can't keep carrying this around. It's going to crush you, and it will kill you someday. Mm -hmm. Unload the weight of the world. Seek the glory of God. Seek first the kingdom of heaven, and all these things will be added to you. Seek the glory of God, and you can heal the broken heart. He can heal whatever it is you came in here with. He can heal the brokenhearted, and he can forgive your sins. It is in the name of Jesus that we have this victory. If you would just reach out and take it. Just take it. So the altars are open. I'm going to say a quick prayer real quick. I'm going to do it a little different. Is that all right? I'd like to do the invitation in silence today. No music, no singing. I want us to invite the presence of God in this room. Because there are some heavy hearts in this room. There are some hearts that walked in with this, this weight on them. I know you're struggling, and I, I know you're out there. So, and, and we're going to, I know preachers say this all the time, but eyes closed about that. You're going to invite the presence of God in this room. And if you have carried a weight in here with you, I want you to come up here to these altars and lay it at the feet of our God. Lay it at the feet of our Messiah and say, God, I'm so tired. I'm so tired of feeling broken. I'm so I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. I'm sick and tired of being angry. I'm sick and tired of, of, of feeling like I, I, I'm spinning my wheels. I'm sick and tired of doing this, God, and I need you to do something. So the altar is going to be open. And I would encourage you to lay them at the feet of our God. Father God, I thank you so much for what you've done. I thank you that you sent your son to do what we couldn't do, to take the weight of our sin upon his shoulders. To carry that weight with him to the cross. To endure the punishment. To endure the shame. So that we may have freedom in Jesus' name. 
And I pray your spirit over this room. I, I pray the name of Jesus over this room. That you may do a work in their lives today. That they may encounter you in a real, in a new way, God. That somebody may experience you for the first time. That they may know it is in Jesus' name that they have peace. It is in Jesus' name that they have calmness. It is in Jesus' name that you can make them whole again. To do what the pastor cannot do. To do what the church cannot do. To do what their mothers and their fathers cannot do. But to do what only you can do, God. I pray your presence over this room right now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.